So uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you out there in TV land. Uh, if you could take a poll of how many people are surfing the net while listening, it would be interesting, but we can watch it go up as I talk. Uh, so I, I've been gone from Environment Canada well, probably about 17 years or so, and some things haven't changed. Uh, the value of science has not changed. Uh, without science, industry and society are trying to drive without a windshield, like with a windshield completely blocked. Uh, our industry, Canadian society, still depends upon Environment Canada science just as much as we did back in my day. Uh, and without the science support of this department, we would not have a boreal agreement. The regulation still matters. Uh, we would probably not have a boreal agreement if there wasn't the backdrop, the uh, environmental safety net of a regulatory regime. And the other thing that hasn't changed is probably the central dilemma. The hardest piece is still the, what they used to call the tragedy of the commons or the mystery of the commons. But the essential policy dilemma that you're facing is the simple fact that karma doesn't work for the environment, that the polluters don't suffer more than the non-polluters, that how much you get, suffer from the consequences of environmental degradation uh, is not a function of how much you've contributed to it, which makes it a very hard policy area. And then the final thing that hasn't changed because of the dilemma of the commons is that in addition to your science and regulatory function, your leadership function, and I, I know it's not necessarily a word that uh, you might be using all the time these days, but your leadership function remains probably your most important role. The others are all necessary, but not sufficient without the leadership function. And so I thought I'd start with what I've learned a little bit over the years about how to exercise leadership in an area uh, in which authority is somewhat diffuse. And I, I was thinking as I was trudge, trudging through the snow this morning about my first real lesson in leadership, which when I was a, a relatively junior officer and I was uh, staffed to a DMs committee, I think it was PS2000, we were trying to figure out how to change staffing in the year 2000. I can assure you that almost everything they were planning to fix uh, remains a dilemma today. Uh, but I was listening, you know, as a, a young guy, listening to the DMs complain about the system. And I was thinking to myself, you guys are the system. I mean, you know, we got the president of the Treasury Board, the head of the Public Service Commission, a bunch of senior deputies complaining about the system. And, and as they talked about their embeddedness in a system, and their lack of individual authority within that system, what I come to understand is that, in fact, no one is in charge. We're all embedded in a system. And, and this idea that there really isn't a parental unit making things happen, but in fact, we're all in a system, is a profoundly adult concept. Let me trace a little bit of my maturation as a policy guy. When I was in ES5, do you still have ESs? When I was in ES5 uh, and I had a file, I believed that I was the center of the universe for that file. I would figure it out. I would come up with a solution. I would brief my ADM and, uh, and maybe get to see the deputy. And the world should shift because I was in charge of the file. As, as I got older and got promoted, I realized that really it, it was the deputy or the minister who were the center of the universe. And then as I you know, became an ADM, I realized that the sun really shines through Wayne Water's smile. It, it, it's PCO, it's, it's Langevin block that is the center of the universe. But these Copernican ideas about you know, where the center is are fundamentally wrong. The universe has no center. The policy universe has no center. No individual has the authority to change important things by themselves. 
It's a post-Copernican universe. It's a universe in which power is shared and distributed. And I lived, as you live, in a world in which the assumption is a geography of power being delegated down from the prime minister through his ministers to deputies and all the way through. You're given a file and you're asked to do the right thing by it based upon your delegated authority. But to solve climate change, to protect biodiversity, to protect the commons in all the threats to it, actually, there is no center. There is no authority. Everybody has their authorities. Everybody has their relative power. And to be a policy leader, you have to learn how to work in a world which is not linear that way, in a world in which there isn't a center, but rather in which all sorts of power centers have to come together and learn to do things together. Let's talk about what the job is. That's, we talked a little bit about the, the preconditions of exercising leadership. But what do we have to exercise leadership on? Probably for me, the most interesting moment was in the months leading up to Kyoto. There was a phone call between Mr. Clinton and Mr. Kretien in which they shared targets. There are many myth myths about that phone call, uh, some of which are true. Uh, but what I can share is that Mr. Kretien came out of that phone call with a number. And I was called to PCO, as was Mike Cleland from Natural Resources, Paul Heinbecker from Foreign Affairs, and we said, here's kind of this number we're going into the negotiations. And I got it, went, it was in room 540, the room without windows, terrible room in, 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 in PCO. I, I, went to the, I went up to the flip chart and I drew a couple of curves. These are our projected emissions. This is what the number would have, and there's a gap between them. So gentlemen, our job is to stop that gap. Our job is to change the trajectory. And there's many ways of doing it. We can slow down the economy. Probably won't be a popular, but it would work. We'd get the emissions right back to where if we slow down the economy. Or we could adopt technology that allowed us to grow the economy without growing greenhouse gases. So let's think of that as our technology gap for meeting what the prime minister wants to do. And everybody seemed happy with that. But of course, it was a hugely innocent thought because to get technology adopted, you need economic instruments. And so many of you, I don't know how many here are working on economic instruments, whether you still work on them, but the whole economic analysis group was started in response to realizing that if we're gonna get the needed technology to change the trajectory internalized in the economy, we, we need economic instruments. But as soon as we suggested an economic instrument, we were told, uh, quite properly, this economy doesn't live in a bubble. We're not in isolation. We're part of the North American marketplace. We're part of the global marketplace. And besides, even if you ch changed our trajectory, who cares because of the commons issue, uh, the global climate change will still happen unless everybody else agrees. And so it became clear that the business of changing trajectories uh, is one which is embedded in this very, very complicated universe. It's worth thinking a little bit about how people understand environmental trajectories. You know, again, when the world was young, Pierre Trudeau belonged to the Club of Rome, and we were all interested in the concept of limits to growth. And the lines were going up in a nice steady way, and everyone was worried that we'd surpass the Earth's carrying capacity if they kept going up that way. And each time someone would say this, Malthus would sort of jump out of his grave and show up at the Club of Rome meeting and say, see, I told you so, and he'd always be wrong. Each time Malthus would say, I told you so, he'd be wrong, because uh, we'd keep thinking up of things that would change their trajectory, that would, uh, allow us to continue growing without uh, reaching limits to growth. But those were innocent days because what we didn't understand is this curve was actually not a line, it was a hockey stick. And what looked like a, a arithmetic progression was actually an exponential curve. And now all of a sudden, 
most of those trajectories are no longer going like this, but they're starting to go up. Whether you're looking at greenhouse gases, nitrogen lo loading, uh, water issues, most of the curves have turned and are starting to climb very steeply. And we're all getting a little nervous. It's not just the odd eccentric who belongs to the Club of Rome. We're all getting a little nervous. Will society be capable of changing those trajectories now that the numbers are zooming up? And Malthus is you know, set, grabbing the hockey stick and saying, I shoot, I score. You guys have been wrong all along. My time has come. And then up shows Mr. Moore. You know Moore's Law, that computing moves up on an exponential curve. And, and we're all kind of hoping, we're all kind of hoping that we will increase the speed and power of technological innovation that will allow us to flatten out these trajectories and change them through adopting new technology. And yet, anyone who's actually studied the numbers or looked at recent progress in changing those curves has got to feel a little worried. Our progress is not sufficient. And while the technology is mostly out there, it's not being adopted. And the reason why it's not being adopted is because we're forgetting an essential factor. We're forgetting the social factor. Human progress is not just a function of technical progress or scientific progress. Human progress is a function of the capacity to get along and make technical progress. Without collaboration, technical progress doesn't take us anywhere. Hence, Floppenhagen and all the other uh, failed uh, attempts at global consensus. The problem is not that we don't have the technology, some of it's there, and the rest of it can be developed. The problem is not that there isn't the money to invest in shifting technology. The capital is there, it's just being put elsewhere. The problem is that we don't have the social capacity to come to a common view that we should do this. The problem is fundamentally not technical and not economic, the problem is social. The problem of the commons is that we share, we share stewardship of the global commons, but we don't have a shared view, a shared interest, a community of spirit in trying to address these problems of the commons, and therefore we are failing. Go into a room at the UN when climate negotiations are on, or for that matter, go into a FedProv consultation or go into an interdepartmental meeting. And what is the social phenomena that is most at play? It's tribalism. Humans are a tribal species trying to manage a global planet. And even though that tribalism masquerades as national interest at the UN, I'm trying to take care of my country's interests, every country's interest isn't in actually fixing climate change. It's not in winning the narrow little positional interest of its country. And our problem is that we approach global problems from an international between nations perspective and the human tendency towards tribalism is given full play in all those discussions. It's not just governments, industries do it too. Bring different sectors to the table to discuss environmental progress and we'll all discuss it from the point of view of our self-interest. Bring the you know, look at the provincial initiatives on climate change and they're all reflections of individual self-interest, what they can do easily or what they can profit from or what will cost them very little. So we've got a social system that's based upon fundamentally tribal instincts, the uh, pursuit of tribal self-interest, and we have a environmental system that requires our capacity to transcend that and understand our community of interest. Because if we win for our tribe on climate or a host of other environmental problems, 
we lose for our tribe because the problem doesn't get solved. And so it's not a question of selfishness, it's a question of short-sightedness. And you have to ask yourself, is there any other way? Is it possible to exercise leadership in a way that takes into account the simple hard reality that people's ex uh, pursuit of their positions is contrary to their pursuit of their interest, which is in actually seeing the environmental problem solved. And I know this talk was about what I've learned since I've left, but a lot of it is going to be about what I still don't know. The short answer is, I'm not quite sure where the solution lies. I'm very certain that that's where the problem lies. And I have some ideas and experiences, and that's where the Boreal Agreement comes in, of how to transcend tribalism, how to transcend self-interest, and pursue collective interest in a way that allows progress. Well, what do you need? You need two things. You need the will, the desire, the drive, and you need the way. It's not good enough for everyone to say, we want it. You also have to know how to get it. I'd say globally on environmental issues, neither the will nor the way is properly manifest. There is not today sufficient clarity that the global community who is dependent upon the global commons cares enough about saving it. And you've got to ask yourself, is there any way that this will change? And I think there is. In fact, I feel relatively certain there is. And I think the answer, I don't know it's there, but I'm pretty certain it's there, is actually in the internet. You know, Marshall McLuhan said that the medium is the message. And what did he mean? He didn't mean that uh, message in the traditional sense. You can see McLuhan fans, they always sort of smirk when finally someone actually brings up McLuhan. Uh, that it, he meant that using the medium changes how you are as a person. And that is a more deep impact. That is a more fundamental message than the actual content. So what's the message of television? You're a passive receiver of stuff. Be still. Take it all in. That's how television affects people. But what's, what's the message of the internet? Well, no one knows yet, but I'm willing to guess that the primary impact of the internet will be people thinking that A, they actually have a voice. Your like, don't like, or your contribution to the silly blog conversation is there, and thinking that uh, they are not alone. So no matter what your opinion, on the internet, you can find a community. And I think it's reasonable to expect, or at least to hope, that we will see an environmental spring just like we've seen an Arab Spring. That with the increasing cost of environmental degradation, the, those who depend upon the global commons, that's all of us on this planet, will rise up and say, save our commons. Don't forget what we're facing. In the next year, and every year after that, we'll be adding 80 million people to the Earth. It's a lot. Try and figure out where you'd put 80 million people. Global GDP will be doubling over the next 20 years. So take the impact of all current economic activities and double it. This counts for a little bit of echo efficiency, but you're still talking about a huge amount of environmental stress. The middle class will have outnumbered the poor by 2020. Think of all the increased consumption per capita. With all these increases in environmental stress, it won't be a subtle thing. And the, I don't think there'll be any doubt that most people on this planet will be wanting something done. And the internet will be the channel for the global voice saying, save our commons. But let's say that happens, will we be able to do it? Will we be able to go into those rooms in the UN and problem solve instead of pursue interests? And the answer is yes, but we'll have to learn how. That no one running UN meetings now 
has the skill set to set up problem solving as opposed to interest resolving meetings. That people going to those meetings right now haven't been trained in solution space technology. And that generally our skills and technology around community resolution of common problems are way underdeveloped. There's a group at MIT who we used uh, to tutor us before we did the Boyle Agreement that's specializing in that, led by uh, Peter Sharmer. And, and their, their question is, how do you solve tough problems? How do you get a group of people representing interests to put the interests aside and solve problems? How do you get a group to ask not the question, uh, how do I get off easiest on the climate change negotiations, but rather, how do we solve the climate problem? How do we get people to take off their positional hats and own the responsibility for finding it? So that technology is being developed. Those skills are there, but uh, it's not a casual thing. It may be the most urgent question facing humanity is can we develop the structures, skills, processes? Can we develop the technology, the technique in order to be able to face our common problems. And it's not just environmental. Look at the economic system. Why are we stumbling piece after piece? It's not because you can't figure out what to do. It's because everyone continues to try and find a solution which minimizes the risk to them. And therefore, the international banking system continues to stumble forward. That technology is necessary for all problems which are global and few problems are anything but today. So let's talk about the Boreal Agreement, which is what you invited me to talk about. And so I suppose I should talk a little bit about it. Uh, what did I and, and my colleagues who negotiated learn about problem solving? What did we learn about social processes? What did we learn about will? Well, in some ways, the will was easier because we were all suffering. The environmental community was suffering because despite uh, some successes in market campaigns, despite successes in embarrassing company, despite a lot of publicity and flash, they were losing the war in terms of conservation. The threat to the caribou was still unabated. The, advan the advances they made were tactical, but the overall uh, threat to biodiversity in Canada was not being won through campaigning. Not that different from what's happening now with oil and gas. Uh, yes, they are embarrassing them, but they are not winning. From an industry perspective, there was also a will because the war was proving costly. No, we weren't losing huge numbers of sales, but our reputations were being damaged. Our good name was being damaged. Our brand was being damaged. And without your good name and brand, it's very hard to be aggressive and successful in business. Everything you do is looked at through the lens of your reputation. And so for the environmental community, they wanted results and their funders wanted results. For the business community, we found that no matter how much we improved environmentally, we were not getting credit for it because the environmental community was saying we had to do more. So there was a will to find a solution. And yet, on both sides, there was a reluctance to enter into it because for the industry community, no one wanted to talk to people who were so busy insulting them. And, and, a, and a large part of the approach of the environmental community is to blame, is to shame, is to try and create the environmental issues as a morality play with bad guys and, and good guys. And if you're called a bad guy, what do you do inside? You think those guys are wrong and you react. You, 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 you reject everything they say and everything they stand for and your self-concept is against that. Because if you accepted that, it would mean you're a bad person. And for the environmental groups, the industry is fundamentally Beelzebub. Your whole raison d'etre, meaning in life, what you are there for, where your passion is, is to stop Beelzebub from destroying Mother Earth, from destroying nature. 
So even though we both had a strong interest in getting together, we had strong psychological and social constraints in getting together. We're still, uh, we all lived in social networks where if you would uh, choose to work with the other side, everybody on your team would think you're a traitor. And for the environmental groups that negotiated with us, it was a huge issue whether or not the, uh, their constituencies would see them selling out. And for industry, it was a similar. You know, if we do a deal with Greenpeace, does that mean Greenpeace is anything but a, a fringe, radical, crazy group that should be dismissed? So we were, in fact, when we negotiated with them, our industrial friends were saying, you're validating them. And so there was a huge pressure from outside to try and not do this. But deep down, we all knew that the status quo could only be described as stupid. The idea that uh, we could dismiss society's environmental voice might be strident and it might be full of half-truths, but it is the voice of society's desire for environmental progress, that we could dismiss that voice and still have legitimacy in society, that was wrong, and we knew it. And for the environmental groups knew that the only place they're going to get environmental progress is from us. There's no point uh, asking for logging practices to change unless you talk to loggers. There's no point asking about where harvesting should be done and how to protect species unless you talk to the people who are doing it. And they long ago learned that simply lobbying government doesn't work because we can lobby back. So in fact, the people who are the problem for both of us were the only people we could talk to to find the solution. And even though nobody really liked doing it very much, we all knew we should. And so we entered into negotiations, and what happened in the negotiations, and I could talk forever on this, so I'm going to just give you a brief synopsis, was a movement from position-based negotiations, you got to do this or I won't sign, to interest-based negotiations, well, I suppose if I can get this, I might sign, to problem-based negotiations. I wonder how we can figure out how to maintain enough wood to keep this mill operating without undermining ecosystem values. And that, the third part, problem-based negotiations, turned out not to be negotiations at all. It was problem-solving. Getting out maps in a very practical way and saying, OK, this mill needs so many uh, cubic meters of wood, otherwise everybody gets laid off. These caribou needs so much pristine forest, otherwise they're not going to make babies anymore. Is there any way on this map we can figure this out? And as soon as you get into that problem-solving mode, what happens is you don't become opposing parties with different interests. You become a community with the same interest of finding the solution. And for the most part, for the most part, we've been doing it. We slip back all the time into positional attitudes. We even slip back into name calling, though I think we're a little less colorful than we used to be. Uh, we slip back into stupid uh, positional intransigence. And we get really resentful with each other because we have such a long history. But 70% of what we do, and we've been doing it now for three and a half years, is problem solving based, trying to figure out where the solution lies. And I can tell you that it's a joy. It feels like, well, this was how the world is supposed to work. It's, you know, when the Boral Agreement was announced, uh, one of my uncles called me and said, well, thank God. Whoever thought that the answer lies in lumbering out the entire forest, and whoever thought the answer lies in killing all the lumber jobs. We all knew that the answer lies in trying to reconcile the two. And so it feels good. It feels almost like, like music and poetry sometimes when we leave our positions and, as a community, find the solutions. We then have to go out and try and sell them, and we get everybody's positional pushbacks. Sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we just get dumb. But most of the time, uh, it works really, really well. And I am certain 
that in that experience is, is a lesson for environmental leadership. Because here we have a situation in which no one has the authority. The environmental groups don't have the authority. The industry doesn't really have the authority. And certainly I, as an associate head, association head, doesn't have the authority. But working within a post-Copernican universe, in which everybody has a little bit of authority, the provinces, the federal government, First Nations, local communities, working within this post-Copernican universe with a sense of what problem has to be solved and with really good technique and sophisticated uh, methods, we are able to solve environmental problems in a way that doesn't just solve the environmental problem, but actually integrates the economic and the environmental imperatives. When I say integrates, because sure, there sometimes is a bit of a trade-off, but often when you integrate the two, you actually get uh, something that's not a trade-off, but a win-win. So I started by saying, you guys got a job to do. And a large part of that job is science, make certain that the windshield isn't dirty, we know where we're going. Regulation, make certain that uh, the backstop, the security blanket of all civil society processes are still there. But it's, it's also, you have an opportunity to be a convener. You have an opportunity to invite elements of civil society into a solution space. You have an opportunity to provide a container, a holding, for what has to happen in society. And it's not a leadership function in the sense that you're going to force it. It's not about political will that, you know, minister's going to make it happen. The world doesn't work that way. It's about recognizing the distributed nature of power around the issues which you care about, and then using your leadership capacity, the fact that you have the science, the fact that you are Environment Canada, to bring the parties together to try and find solutions. And I noticed that in the speech from the throne, there was a national conservation strategy. Would it ever be cool if a big part of that national conservation strategy was implemented by you using your convening function to create solution spaces where those who care, those who care about their jobs, those who care about nature, those who care about their communities could come together and find solutions. Thank you.